Thanks. So, um, so I put some things on the board that uh, are recollections from yesterday. So I tried to. So I, I explained the setup of Hamiltonian flare theory yesterday in the simplest possible setting. So we start with a closed symplectic manifold M, and then eventually we sort of introduce these two assumptions. One was that omega vanishes on on all spherical uh, on all spheres in M, and the second one was that the first Chern class of the symplectic manifold all, also vanishes on all spheres in M, and these two together are sometimes called M is symplectically aspherical, and so if you read that in a paper, that's usually what what that means, and then um, the the inputs that we had was a function h, which was a time-dependent, one-periodic uh, Hamiltonian function on M, and then we had J, which may or may not be time-dependent, also a family of, let's say it's also time-dependent, so it's a, a one-periodic family of almost complex structures which are compatible with omega, and then using these two things, so, so from H, we got this Hamiltonian vector field, XH, and then using also J, we can write down this equation called Fleur's equation, which whose solutions that satisfy this finite energy condition basically are like a substitute for gradient flow lines that one would study in Morse theory. So, and and what we did yesterday was basically I I claimed two things, which so, so I set up a bunch of definitions, but then I made two statements which I didn't prove, which are sort of black boxes, if you will. So, that's still from, from yesterday. So the first one was that um, if we have a Fleur cylinder that satisfies these two conditions, um, then, uh, Actually, the, the limits as s goes to plus and minus infinity exist. Every flow cylinder has well-defined limits. Gamma plus minus, which is the limit as s goes to plus or minus infinity of u of s and whatever the variable is. T in, in my case, and the other one, oh, actually, for that to be literally true, I need that uh, all one periodic orbits of H are non-degenerate. Right. So, so, so that's another assumption um, that we added. So, so, so all my H's will always have have this assumption built in, and then they might have additional ones. And and so, if we assume this, then we get that. And the other thing, the last thing I stated yesterday was that for a generic choice of pair H and J. Um, the moduli space of solutions to Fleur's equation, which are, have given asymptotics gamma plus and gamma minus, That's a manifold of dimension the Kolnitsyne index of gamma plus minus the Kolnitsyne index of gamma minus. So that was the last thing I claimed yesterday. And so here is what I, where I want to continue. Um, so, 
So in fact, sort of slightly more is true under this assumption, this, this convergence is, is actually exponential as s goes to infinity. So, and um, and so, so the second statement here is typically trans, uh, referred to as transversality. And it's, in this case, it's actually fairly simple compared to other things because uh, we don't have, I mean, by making the H and or the J time dependent, we're sort of breaking the S1 symmetry. And so there are no multiple covers that we have to worry about. So it's transversality in this situation is reasonably simple to achieve. Um, all right. So one thing we should note is that, that um, solutions to this equation are invariant under translation in the S direction. So there is a free action of R on this moduli space just by shifting in the domain in the S direction. Right, so if I have a sigma in R and it acts on, on some U by sigma on U, that map at s and t is my u at s plus sigma and t. Right, I just shift. And yeah, since this is linear in, in s, so, so this works out fine. And uh, our next goal is to try and understand the compactification of the quotient space. Right. And again, so, so for this compactification, this assumption here that omega vanishes in pi 2 will come in very handy, will make our life a lot easier than it would be in general. And so that's what I want to say next. So we have the following. So, so from now on, I will always assume these two assumptions. And I will, so I will make these two assumptions and I will also Assume that I've, I've fixed regular FLIR data. So maybe I should say that. So by regular FLIR data, I mean FLIR data such that this statement is true for all gamma plus and gamma minus. And now, then we have the following proposition. So suppose m omega is a closed symplectic manifold and let me make this again explicit because I'm going to use it in the proof omega on pi 2 is 0 Then, if I fix the asymptotics, gamma plus and gamma minus, then I can find a constant C in R such that for all solutions U of the Fleury equation, such, so for all U in my moduli space, with these asymptotics, we have that if I look at the L infinity norm of the differential of U, and that's bounded by C. So, so I have a global bound on the first derivatives. So, 
So that's pretty cool, and that, that, that will basically make our life very simple. So once we, have, once we prove this, then compactness will be a, an easy consequence. And so I want to give you at least sort of an outline of the proof of this. And proofs of this nature are, are, are usually referred to as bubbling analysis. And the way this proof works is that we do a proof by contradiction. So we assume we don't have such a bound, and then we see what happens. So so assume such a constant does not exist with this property. Then, well, what's the contrapositive? So then we find a sequence of maps u k in this moduli space such that this supremum of, of the norm of the derivative is bigger than or equal to k for u k, right? Right, so I take the supremum over the whole domain of the norm of, of the derivative, and I get something that which is at least k. Let's, let me give this a name. Let me call this mk, and this is at least k. A priori, it could be infinite, but yeah. OK. And now, to explain the idea, I will make it a simplifying assumption, and then um, to remove that simplifying assumption, one needs one additional lemma by Hofer, which you can find in Dietmar Salomon's lecture notes, but I will not get into that much detail. So, just to explain the idea, I'll make the simplifying assumption, which is not always met, uh, that this supremum is actually a maximum, it's actually achieved at some point, Zk. So, All right, so for each of these maps, UK, I have some point in my cylinder where I actually have, where, where this maximum is actually, the supremum is achieved. So. And yeah, and as I said, this is not necessary, but it sort of it makes my explanation slightly simpler. And so, so assume we have this, then what we can do is we fix some small epsilon, and we fix an epsilon positive. Think of it as small, and consider the maps VK that will be defined on balls in C, namely on the ball around zero of radius this MK, this supremum times epsilon and they will take values in M, and VK is going to be defined as VK of Z is going to be defined as UK of ZK plus Z divided by M. K. Okay. So what, what this does is basically, what's the picture? I have my UK, which is defined on some cylinder, and I have some point ZK where the maximum is it of, of, of the norm of the derivative is achieved, 
And so now I'm taking the, the epsilon ball around ZK, and I'm rescaling the map in that epsilon ball so that it's now defined on some ball of this radius. Now, what have, what have I gained by this? Well, let's compute what's the... Um, let me call this term here d bar j of u. Let me compute that for, for my vk. So I claim that once I've made this change of variables, then d bar j of vk will have the property that um, this is just going to be 1 over mk of d bar j of uk at the corresponding point. And so this is going to be, um, just to get my signs right, um, yeah, this is going to be 1 over mk j of xh of vk, well, at, at the corresponding point, right? So, so basically, yeah, so, so my xh is a, is a vector field on some compact manifold, so, so this thing is a bounded quantity, so an mk by assumption goes to infinity, so, so as k goes to infinity, this converges to zero. Right? Because this, this thing is bounded, so it has bounded norm, and so these, um, so if I take the quotient by mk, then I get something that converges to zero. And so, um, the other thing that I've achieved is that by uh, rescaling with exactly this maximum here, the, the, the supremum of the norms, what I've also achieved is that the norm of the derivative of vk, the elementary norm, is now equal to 1, and this is achieved exactly at 0. Right? Z equal, so, because I've, I've centered myself at the zk, which I assume to be the maximum, so of the norm of so so I've achieved that vk the derivative of vk takes its maximum norm at zero and this norm is one and so finally by because m is compact uh, we can assume we can pass to a subsequence. to achieve that the values of the vk's at zero converge in m. So we can pass to a subsequence such that vk of zero converge to some x in m as k goes to infinity. Okay? Excellent. So now we have a family of maps defined on larger and larger balls whose derivatives are uniformly bounded by one in norm and whose values at one point converges. So now we can apply the theorem of Arzela and Ascoli on uniform convergence to conclude that these maps actually conform, uh, converge uniformly on compact sets to a limit. And then using the equation we can actually, so, so initially this is just a C0 uniform convergence, but then using, using the equation or something known as elliptic bootstrapping, we can conclude that, in fact, this convergence is not just in C0 on compact sets, but it's actually in C infinity on compact sets. So,
So by passing to a further subsequence, we get convergence. in C infinity log, so meaning on every compact subset of the, of, of the plane uh, of the sequence VK to a limiting map V, and now this limit, so, so these VK are defined on larger and larger balls so my limit will actually be defined on all of C. Right? Because for every compact subset of C, eventually VK will be defined on that compact subset for large enough K, and then by uniform convergence on compact subsets, I will get this limit. And now, because of this property here, that the... Uh, the bar operator applied to VK essentially sort of converges to zero, we see that this limiting map will be a holomorphic map. Right? Okay. And so, <coughs> sorry, once we're this far, now we need another theorem. So, oh, one, one thing we should point out is that what's the energy of this V? Well, the energy of this V is certainly less than or equal to the limb soup over all K of the energy of the UK restricted to these balls of around the points ZK with radius epsilon because the VK were just rescaled versions of these, of these maps. And so this is certainly less than the limb soup over K of the energy of UK. But all of these maps had the same energy, namely uh, the difference of the... Uh, A h of gamma plus minus A h of gamma minus. So this is finite. So I know that not only do I get a holomorphic map from C to M, but it's also as finite energy. And so now I'm going to apply another theorem, which I don't have time to explain, which is called removal of singularities, for which you need exactly this as input. So you need a map from C to M of finite energy, so now removal of singularities means that is that any such map actually extends to a map to the sphere from the sphere. And so here now is where I'm going to use my assumption that omega vanishes in pi 2, such a map. So, oh, the other thing I know is that uh, since all the VK had norm of their derivative at, one, at, at 0 equal to 1, this V actually will also have this property. The norm of the derivative at 0 will be 1. And that means it is that V is non-constant. Right? Because it has one point where its derivative is not, not zero, so near that point it's non-zero. It, it, it's not constant, so it's not constant. And such maps don't exist. Right?
Well, why is that? Well, this map is J-holomorphic, so every, at every image point, the tangent space is a complex one-dimensional subspace of, of the tangent space of M, right? So, so it's, it's invariant the J, that's what this equation tells me, and omega on any complex subspace is positive. So if I pull back, so V star omega is positive whenever GV is not equal to zero, which is an open and dense set. And so therefore, so we would need to have that the integral of V star omega over S2 would be positive, but by our assumption it has to be zero. And so that's the desired contradiction. And so therefore our initial assumption that this C doesn't exist was false, so we have this constant C. Right? So this concludes the proof of the theorem. Under the simplifying assumption, as I said, so in general what you do is basically you find points ZK such that on a sufficiently small ball, the norm, they're, they're, they're almost maximal for the, for, the, for the norm of the relative, and that's good enough for this argument. So the precise, as I said, the precise lemma you can find in, in Dietmar's notes. Questions about this? Yeah? I'm sorry? Well, um, we're on a compact manifold, and we have some vector field globally defined on this compact manifold, so it has bounded norm. And so J of it is another vector field that also has bounded norm. So, so this vector field is a, is a vector field on a compact manifold, so it has bounded norm, and so because I'm dividing by larger and larger constant, this has to go to zero. Okay? Very good. So now, what, do, what does this bound by us? Well, um, once we have this, then we can again sort of apply this azela ascoli type and bootstrapping type argument to say that any sequence of maps in, in this moduli space, they now satisfy a uniform bound on their derivatives, so therefore, they have a subsequence which, which converge in C infinity log to some limit, right? So, so from From this assumption, we conclude that every sequence has a subsequence. Converging in on in C infinity on compact subsets to another solution of the Fourier equation. Um, so, so one. Very important point is that I'm not claiming that it actually 
converges to another element of this space. Right? So, so the asymptotic, so, so it will be another solution of Fleur's equation, it will, because all the U's have bounded energy, this will also have bounded energy, so it will be in some moduli space, but it might have different asymptotics. And the simplest example of what this can happen is, if you just take one map, U, and now you put the case out of this one map by just shifting to one side, right? Like shifting by larger and larger S, say. Then basically, what you do is, so you have your, your cylinder, and now, example. Suppose U0 is, is some map in the moduli space, so, so it's some map into M such that here near minus infinity it converges to gamma minus, near plus infinity it converges to gamma plus, and now, and UK of S and T are just defined to be U0 of F, S plus K and T. Right? I'm just taking the same map and just shifting it sort of just focusing sort of more and more on this end. Then, then the UK will converge in C infinity log to a map U, and this map U, what, what's it going to be? Well, it's actually going to be constant in the S direction. It's just going to be this a parameterization of this gamma plus. So. So U is going to, U of S and T will actually be independent of S. It will just be gamma plus of T. And notice that that solves my equation. So, so if I look at my Fleur equation, if I have a map which is independent of S, then this term is zero. And if, if the, the T direction solves the Hamiltonian equation, so it's a one periodic orbit of XH, then I get a solution of this equation, right? And that's one example. And that's, so, so you see, even, even if you're, you're studying with, with a sequence in this modular space, you might get something, conversion C infinity log is not sufficient to, to say that the limit has to be in that modular space. It might be in some other one. And I mean, you, you know the same thing from Morse theory. I mean, if you have a, if you have a, a Morse trajectory connecting to critical points, and you really think of this as a map, then if you focus sort of on, right, if you shift so that you, you get closer and closer to this point, then as, as maps, they will converge to the constant map here, if you do it right, on C, in C infinity log. I mean, not globally, but on compact subsets, they will converge to the constant map to that point. So that's exactly the same kind of phenomenon that I have here. Okay? Now, more interestingly, basically that's, well, what can happen is now in Morse theory you had this phenomenon that sort of a sequence could converge to sort of a broken thing, right, where, where you sort of have break up into two gradient trajectory lines, and that basically that's, I claim that sort of two or more, right, I mean in principle there could be more breakings, and I claim that for Fleur cylinders, now that's also the only thing that can happen. So let me formulate that as another corollary of, of our proposition. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so it's very important to, to specify the in some sense, in which sense. So, so my energy does go to zero at the end, in the L2 sense. But it's, and, and sort of, but the point is sort of, because I have this, this flexibility of, of shifting, I'm, I, I can always sort of do this kind of stupid trick. But, so, so let me state a theorem that, that tells you sort of in which sense such a, I mean, you could state a similar, similar theorem for Morse theory, but I'll, I'll state it for Fleur theory because I'm here, this is where I'm going to use it. In which sense, sort of, 
a family of things in the sort of when, when I take the quotient space. Right, so let's, let, let me just state it. So and this is sort of this compactness theorem is kind of the analog of what Sushmita did in the in the Lagrangian theory case, where she said, well, a strip if if you if I have a one parameter family of, of of strips, then basically the worst thing that can happen is that it breaks into two strips. And now I'm since I'm not necessarily think just thinking about one parameter families, I'm gonna state it in general. So um, Under our assumptions, so we have regular flow data. For any sequence UK in this modular space gamma plus sort of with these asymptotics, um, there is subsequent. Well, let me actually, yeah, let me actually pass to to the quotient. So I'm just going to talk, think about equivalence classes up to R shift, right? Because when I draw these pictures, I'm I'm really saying sort of this unparameterized this sequence of unparameterized full lines. So so meaning that sort of I don't care about the shift in the limit converges to sort of this one plus this one, right? And so that's what I'm, that's what I want to formalize. So I want to have a sequence in this quotient space. And for that, I claim <coughs> there's a subsequence um, actually, mm, no, no, I, I can't. To formulate the theorem, I can't take the quotient yet, so I have to take the quotient afterwards. So, so let me start. Yeah, let me go back and just take the sequence because, in order to 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 say what I mean by the convergence, I need the actual maps, not just the maps up to reparameterization. But, but yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that point. So, for any sequence here, there's a subsequence which converges. To a broken floor cylinder um, um, in the following sense. So, so first I have to tell you what a broken floor cylinder is. So a broken floor cylinder is basically the analog of this picture. So I have a bunch of cylinders such that the, the positive as asymptotic of one is the negative asymptotic to the next. Right? So this is, so, so we have V1, V2, V3, V4 in this case. So V1 is in M gamma plus gamma 1. V2 is in M gamma 1, gamma 2. And Vr is in M gamma r minus 1, gamma minus. Right? So, so they, they, they match in this sense. And There are sequences of real numbers S K one less than oh no I have to Oh now I got my things backwards. So S K R less than S K R minus one 
less than SK1. such that the difference of any two consecutive ones goes to infinity, as k goes to infinity, such that if I look at my uk and I, re -sh I shift it by sort of centering at skj, then I, they converge to the vj such that um, uk of s plus skj t converge to vj of s and t and c infinity lock. Right? So basically what I'm saying is that, let's, let's do sort of the analog in Morse theory. I have a sequence of flow lines, and basically if I if I shift in a certain way, then on compact, uniform and compact subsets, it converges to this flow line. But if I shift the other way, and I sort of put my looking glass in a different region, then on uniform and compact subsets, it, should, it, it converges to this one. And basically, the fact that I'm, I'm connecting gamma plus all the way to gamma minus guarantees that I've basically found all the essential pieces. Right? So, so I haven't lost anything. Is that statement, does that make sense? Is that clear? That's sort of the analog of, 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 of the picture in Morse theory that a flow line up, up to shift converges to a sequence of broken flow lines. All right, so, so the corollary is that if the difference of Conley-Tainer indices is equal to one, then the moduli space up to shift is compact. Well, it's of dimension zero after, after modding out the R action because it was of dimension one before, but it's also compact. And if the Conley-Tain index of gamma plus minus the Conley-Tain index of gamma minus is equal to two, then the boundary of This moduli space is a union over all. So then these have index difference too, so there's exactly one index in between. So this is a union over all gamma such that the Conley-Tain index of gamma minus is less than the Conley-Tain index of gamma is less than the Conley-Tain index of gamma plus, where now I take the moduli space from gamma plus to gamma mod r times the moduli space from gamma to gamma is mod r. And if I had talked about orientations, then I would even assert that this is true with more orientations. And, and the proof is, well, so by, by the theorem, if it breaks, it has to break in, into a bunch of cylinders. And now, if the index difference is one, there's no non-trivial way in which it can break, because the... So... Well... Such a moduli space, m gamma 1, gamma 2, is only non-empty if the index is, is positive.
So if the index difference of Cognitin indices is positive, that's by regularity. So, so that immediately proves A because then there's nothing, there's, there's no way in which this such a sequence can sort of converge to some non-trivial limit. And for B, you, you get that these are all the possibilities, and then you have to prove a gluing theorem which states that all points, I mean, any broken flow line indeed does arise as a limit in a unique way. Right? So this is really a statement about sort of the boundary in a sense of manifolds. This is a manifold with boundary, and its boundary consists exactly of all these points. Yeah? Oh, so, so I, I take a sequence here, and now... I'm taking it up to shift, so I'm not sort of, I'm excluding this example, right? So if it breaks, it has to break into to, to two non-trivial things. And so, but then, for, because I'm assuming that I've already chosen regular data, these have to be in, in non-empty moduli spaces, so both index differences would have to be positive, but that cannot be because the sum of them has to be one. Right, so for A, I immediately get that, and then for B, I get that these are all the possible things, but then I need a gluing theorem that tells me that exactly each one of them occurs exactly once. So that's the hard part. So let me finish that sentence. Um, questions? Yeah? <laughs> yes, so, so that's a good point. So basically, yes. So, so the, the, there has to be some argument like that. that and, and the reason for that is that the action spectrum is discrete. So that's another thing I didn't mention. So, so if, you look at, if I look at the actions of the, of the critical values, they form a discrete set. So between any two ones, I only have finitely many. So that's a separate argument, which I didn't mention. Which, yeah, but, but you're right. One has to make an additional argument to know that there's a finite thing. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I should have pointed that out. All right, still with me? So now we're ready to define FLIR theory, uh, FLIR homology for this pair HJ. All right, so now, um, Right, so I'm, I'm still talking about a fixed H and a fixed J, right? So for each one periodic orbit of gamma of XH, we set the grading of gamma to e be equal to Cognitin index of gamma minus N. That's just a convention. At this point, it wouldn't, you wouldn't see a difference. I could have, could have just used the Cognitin index, but for later purposes, it's convenient to shift. And now, the, the fur complex in degree k of h and j is by definition just generated. So it's a direct sum of copies of z generated by orbits 
that have this index equal to k, and and the boundary operator, the boundary of some generator gamma, gamma let's say gamma plus, is by definition the sum over all gamma minus, which have index one less. So in particular, they have condensate index one less. And then I count, and this is an oriented count, the elements of the moduli space gamma plus, gamma, gamma minus, mod r, and then I take that as the coefficient of gamma minus. Yes? N. N is the dimension, so 2n was the dimension of my manifold, so yeah, this is, my n's and my u's are, look the same, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. And so then, basically, This part A of the corollary says that this is a meaningful definition. So there, there's something to count here because I have finitely many things. And part B of the corollary, if I put in orientations, says that d squared equal to zero. So, so therefore we get the Fleur homology of a given regular Fleur data is now just by definition just the homology of this chain complex. Okay, so now of course the next question is does this depend on H and J in how? Right? And for that, we need a way to compare. So, so a priori, I mean, for all I know, this could be zero, right? I mean, maybe, maybe I had picked an H that doesn't have any critical, that doesn't have any one periodic orbits, and then this would be completely zero. So I need a way of comparing it for different H's so eventually I can compute it. Okay, so... So for the dependence on, on H and J, basically, we, we want to write down a map that compares these chain complexes. And for that, so let H plus, J plus, and H minus, J minus, be two sets of Fleur data. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pick a family connecting them, right? So the space of functions is connected and the space of compatible almost complex structures is also connected. So we can pick a family which now depends on S in R. Such that for S, say, less than or equal to minus 1, they're always equal to H minus J minus. And for S, bigger than or equal to plus one, they're equal to H plus and J plus. 
Right, so basically, on my cylinder, I have, I have sort of three regions. Right, so I have minus infinity here up to minus one. Then I have plus one and then I have plus infinity. So here, I have h minus and j minus as data. Here I have h plus and j plus as data, and in the, in the middle I have some interpol interpolating family. Right? And so now I look at the Fleury equation with this, with this data. Right? So, for gamma plus, the periodic orbit for H plus, or, yeah. All right, so, so gamma plus is the periodic orbit for, for H plus, and gamma minus, periodic orbit for H minus, we now, consider the, moduli space of connecting cylinders, so C of gamma plus, gamma minus. So these are all the maps U from the cylinder to M, which now satisfy Fleur's equation with this S-dependent data, right? So del S of U plus J S of u of dt of u plus x h s of u uh, minus is equal to zero. And the limits should be as I described. And then the claim is that uh, So again, sort of for a generic choice of this connecting family, this is a manifold of dimension the same as before. Difference of condensation indices, but notice that this time we don't have the R action anymore because now our data depends on S. So if I shift my map by by something in the S direction, it will no longer satisfy the equation because now the J and the, the H depend on S. So if I shift, I destroy my equation, and so zero-dimensional moduli spaces can be non-empty, and in fact, what happens is that uh, so there's an analog of this corollary there. So similar. To the previous situation, um, we have two things. So if if the index difference is zero, then this space is compact. And if the index difference is one, then the space is not compact, but it can be compactified. So 
So it can be compactified to a manifold with boundary. And so now what, what could happen basically before when I had sort of invariant, as invariant data, things could break up into several cylinders, right? And so now, basically, similar thing can happen. Either something can break off at this end, and then what breaks off has to be sort of one of these Fleur cylinders for the, for the data H minus, J minus, or something can break off at this end, but it has to be a Fleur cylinder for data H plus, J plus. So the boundary has to look like either, so it's a union of two pieces, so it's a union of over gamma minus prime of um, connecting trajectories from gamma plus to gamma minus prime, and then I'm taking trajectories for the minus data from gamma minus prime to gamma minus up to R shift. That's one option. And the other option would be I have gamma plus prime, so what can happen is I first have a Fleur cylinder from gamma plus to gamma plus prime up to R shift, and then I have connecting cylinder from gamma plus prime to gamma minus. And the indices here, again, have to be such that, that all these spaces are non-empty, so the index, so gamma minus prime has to have the same index as gamma plus, and gamma plus prime has to have the same index as gamma minus. Right? And so, as before, now I, what I can do is, we can define C, a so-called continuation map, from the Fleur complex of H plus and J plus to the Fleur, Fleur complex of H minus and J minus by sending an orbit gamma plus to the sum over all orbits of this system with the same index of the count, again an oriented count, of, of now this moduli space C from gamma plus to gamma minus, and then Part A says this is well defined, and part B says that this is a chain map. Okay. Now, now there's one more step in this, which we have to do, and Namely, now we have to study, well, how does this chain map now depend on this family that we chose? Right? So, so we're trying to study how does the flow homology depend on, on the data. So now we've, between, for any two given things and, and the choice of a family, we constructed a map which depends on this family. So now we want to understand how, the, how does this map, this chain map, depend on this family. And it turns out... <laughs> that uh, if I have two families, right, so now I have a homotopy between the data, and now I'm going to do a homotopy of homotopies. So, two different connecting families can again be connected by a family of families. And 
In terms of equations, this leads to a chain homotopy between the corresponding continuation maps. Right, so if I have two different families connecting H plus and H minus, then I get two different maps, C, C and C prime, but they're chain homotopic. So, and once they're chain homotopic, then on homology, they define the same map. Um, did I mess up somewhere? Oh yeah, so, so I'm multi this is the coefficient of gamma minus. Yes, thank you. All right, so this leads to a chain homotopy of the corresponding continuation map, so conclusion. So if I have two fixed pairs, H plus J plus and H minus J minus, Uh, then all, all, con all possible continuation maps always give the same map on homology. Very good. So now, now to, we would like to now conclude that these are all isomorphisms, and, and how do we do that? Well, now we, we observe two things. So if I have a continuation map from H plus J plus to H minus J minus, and I have another one from this to there, if I just exchange the walls, then I can compose them. So, so the first thing is that the composition of continuation maps C plus minus from HF, H plus, J plus, to HF, H minus, J minus, and the other way around, Um, or do I want HF here? Maybe I want CF here. It doesn't matter. I mean, in the end, I only care about the effect on cohomology, but uh, let me state it on homology, uh, on, on, on the chain complex. All right, so, so by just exchanging the roles of, of the two ends, just sort of taking the inverse family, I also get a continuation map the other way, And if I take the composition, I can basically view that as continuation, as, as another continuation map now from the, from the chain complex, well, depending on which one, which composition I do, I get a map from, from the chain complex of, of the plus data to itself or from a chain complex to the minus data to itself. So this leads to Continuation maps, well, if I do C minus plus composed with C plus minus, 
then this is goes from the minus guy to itself, or if I do it the other way, then I do it from the plus guy to itself. And that's the first thing, so composition can again be interpreted as continuation. And the second thing, we observe that now from, if I'm, if I'm just talking about one guy to itself, I could take the constant family. Right? Right, so if I take, now if I'm going back to just letting the family be constant in S, and, but I, now I think of continuation, then this, uh, gives rise to the identity map from the flow complex of, it, of H to the flow complex of H. Right, because the only rigid things, the only zero dimensional things that can happen for, indi for, for time, for S independent data are actually these things that are just sort of constant in, in S and just per sort of parameterizations of one periodic orbit. So they're just on generators, this is just the identity map. That's the only thing that can happen. And so then we conclude that these compositions, so because now that, that then we conclude that these compositions are chain homotopic to the identities, and from that we conclude that the induced maps on homology have to be isomorphisms, right? So the final conclusion is all continuation maps uh, induce isomorphisms. C plus minus from the Fleur homology of given plus data to the Fleur homology of given minus data. All right, so now I know it's independent of, of the choice of data, but I still don't know if it's non-zero or not. So finally, Right, so now I can sort of talk about the Fleur homology of M omega because it doesn't depend on the choice of which data I picked. But now I want to compute it. And we can pick any convenient data. For that. And so what Fleur did was to say, well, now let's take if you pick H now, C too small and time independent. So H is just a function on M, which is C2 small. And then the claim is that two things happen.
then A all one periodic orbits of XH are constant at the critical points of H And the other thing is that all connecting trajectories just degenerate to Morse connecting trajectories between these critical points. So all Fleur cylinders are also independent of T, and now if I look at my, yeah, so, so, so my flurry equation was dSU plus J dTU minus XH of U equals zero. So now what this, this simplifies to, um, just dSU is equal to J xh of u, and this is just uh, the negative gradient of h. And so therefore, for this particular choice of data, the Fleur homology agrees with the Morse homology of minus h. So it's minus h because I'm sort of, I'm taking the plus side as an input and the minus side as an output. So therefore, the Fleur homology of this particular h and j is just the Morse homology of minus h. But we know that this is, well, up now I have to be more precise with the shift of grading. So, um, yeah, I didn't, yeah, so, so let me just not put in the grading. And then this is equal to the singular homology of M. All right, so, so now, after doing all this work at the very end, we finally see that it was worth it. We've, we've proven that for all regular FLIR data, and so in particular for any H which is non-degenerate since, which has non-degenerate uh, one periodic orbits because we can always make it regular by ch choosing J appropriately, we get a chain complex whose homology computes the homology of M. So in particular, we must have critical points, right? We must have, we must have one periodic orbits. And so we get, get that the number of one periodic orbits is greater than or equal to the sum of the Betty numbers. Yes? Um, so A is actually not so hard. So um, the reason is that we know, so, so let's suppose, let's, let's take H to be just time independent. Forget about C small, just time independent. So it's a function and it has, let's, it's a Morse function because the, the critical, the, the one periodic, the, the fixed points are assumed to be non-degenerate. So in particular, it's a Morse function. And so I know that these critical points are isolated also as one periodic orbits. So I can find small neighborhoods of the critical points where there are no other one periodic orbits. Now, once I take out these small open sets, then I'm left with a compact subset of M where my Hamiltonian vector field now has, doesn't have zeros. And so on that compact subset, I can, I, I can cover it with flow boxes. And so any trajectory, if it wants to close up, it has to pass through one of these, several of these flow boxes completely. So there's a lower bound on the return time. So there's a lower bound on the, on the period of a 
non-trivial one periodic trajectory. And now if I rescale my h, that time goes up. And so eventually I can make the return time of all these non-trivial periodic orbits bigger than one. So that's, that's how C2 small guarantees that A and then B is a little more involved. Yes? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I can again make this regular. I can, I can by perturbing the path of paths, sort of, I know the endpoints are already regular, and so by perturbing it in the interior, I can make that path of paths regular also. And so that allows me to, to give, get the chain homotopy. So I didn't actually formulate that step, but that sort of follows the same blueprint that we did already twice before. Right. Yes, so, so I mean, that's what I'm saying. There, there, there will be a chain homotop. I mean, the, these continuation maps will not agree. There will be chain homotopics. So there will be some map of degree minus one now, right? So which counts sort of these exceptional things that can happen in, in this path of paths. Yes. I, I, didn't, I didn't sort of make this explicit, but that's what I meant. I mean, so, so there... You have to do another version of this now for this path of paths. So, so you make this path as regular as can be, and that means that if you count sort of what happens in a... Now, if you, if you have index difference minus one, then because you have a two-dimensional family of things, then still isolated, you have isolated solutions, and then you look at what, what the boundary of that thing is, and you find the chain homotopy equation. Yes, so... Um, Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so so this is the Morse homology of the function minus h. Right, so, so to, to do more homology, you would usually do the negative gradient flow of whatever function. So this looks like the negative gradient flow of H, but I'm sort of, in, in my construction of Fleur homology, I sort of reversed the roles of, of, of negative and positive n, because I, my inputs were at plus infinity, my, my outputs were at minus infinity. That was sort of one of the strange consequences of my sign conventions. And so it turns out, that is actually the, the Morse homology of minus h. This will, this here for, for compact manifolds, it's completely irrelevant because any function gives you the same homology. It will become relevant when, uh, when I start talking about symplectic homology because for non-compact things it makes, or for things with boundary, it makes a difference whether you take h or minus h. One gives you homology, the other one gives you homology relative to the boundary if you take the right kind of h. Okay, so I have like half a minute before this thing goes off. So I wanted to say, make a few remarks about my simplifying assumptions. Um, they will be very brief, so... Um, or are, do you have other questions on, on this before I... So this is sort of the, the general pl blueprint of what you have to do to, to sort of do any kind of floor theory. So, so, in principle, you would have to do the same kind of argument also in Lagrangian floor theory or in any kind of other thing. You, you sort of, you first make a, a whole bunch of choices and then eventually you get to define something, but then you have to, if you want an invariant of your manifold, then you actually have to prove independence of all these choices and that's usually, so in floor theory, it usually works this way. So, um, what, do I, what do I want to say? Right, so, so some remarks. So, so this, this condition 
that omega vanishes on pi 2, we use twice. The first time, we used it to get our action functional well-defined. on our space of contractible loops. And that's not a serious issue. So if you don't have this, then what we just do we just view our action functional not as a as a function on the space of contractible loops, but on its universal covering. And what's the universal covering of the space of contractible loops? Well, it's the homotopy classes of contractible loops. Well, it's a, it's a contractible loop together with a homotopy class of contraction. So that's a contractible loop with a homotopy class of disk. And that's exactly what we needed to, to write down our omega, our, our action functional, right? So, so this is a pair gamma and u were sort of Gamma is a contractible uh, loop, and U is a homotopy class of disks with boundary of disk of U equal to gamma. Right, that's that's one way to construct the universal covering. So that's, that's easy, but the other one was more serious, namely, the other one was to exclude bubbling. And there you actually, once you go to more general symplectic manifolds, there you actually have to do some work. So this is more serious. And then, so if you, you can put other simplifying assumptions like being monotone, what, what Yasha mentioned this morning, or, or things like that, but then sort of in the general case, this is really sort of where things get hard. Because then you actually have to deal with these holomorphic spheres and you have to incorporate them in the way you define your boundary operator and so on. And the other point, which also already appeared in other talks, was that this condition that C1 vanishes on pi 2 was used to get an integer grading. Right, so, so we use this to see that our condition index is well defined. In general, we only get a grading modulo twice the minimal churn number. Right, so you look at the image of C1 evaluated on spheres, that's a subgroup of Z, and you take the positive generator, call that N, that's the minimal churn number, and then instead of being Z graded, your groups are just graded modulo 2N. And, I mean, and then the other thing is that this Fleur complex actually has more structure, so for example, you can put an infinity structure on it, sort of similar to the way that Sushmita put one on, on the Lagrangian flow complex, and then you can uh, enhance your continuation maps to then actually be infinity morphisms, and then you, you sort of get an infinity algebra well-defined up to homotopy equivalence.
So, so here we're actually, yeah, so here we, we, it's really a flat infinite. There's, there's no mu zero term. Yes. So, so the, the chain complex would still be the same chain complex. It would be generated by, by the contractible loops in this situation. And, and the, the operations would be by counting sort of, so, well, now, now spheres with several, several positive, several inputs and one output, and you have to put sort of, yeah. I mean, there would be, there, there's something to say there, but you can make it work. I'm sorry? Yeah, so in Morse theory, you would do trees, gradient flow tr trees. Well, no, I shouldn't say gradient flow trees because now that has a different meaning. But yeah, you, trees labeled by, by sort of certain Morse data. And you could do, basically, you, you do the analog here, but now you have spheres with several incoming punctures, one outcoming puncture. And you have to let the the... Yeah, you have to put certain constraints on the conformal structure on these spheres to get things right. Basically, all, all, the, all the punctures should be on a great circle and should be ordered in the correct way, and so on. Um, other questions? All right, so then let me stop. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that hopefully in my last lecture when I, uh, I'll try to describe the same kind of structure in, in, in symplectic homology and then I'll also try to give you sort of the underlying space of things, of, 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 of domains that you have to look at. And then, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of well known to experts, but Not sure. Well, no. This part actually might be in, might appear in some work of Seidel. I mean, there, several people have used this in, not exactly in this context, but, but sort of say in, in, in symplectic homology, it's it's sort of well known that this exists, even though it's sort of, with all the details, I don't think it has been completely written down anywhere. Are there other questions? If not, let's thank Yaku.